Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Friedman. I'm the founder of Cannabis Lab Law Accounting and Business. Welcome to our second program for the new year here in 2022. We're excited for this panel, um, and I'm excited for who, who's leading this panel today. So we have a great group. I want to go over a few news and notes before we get started. For those of you who don't know about Cannabis Lab, we're an industry association, um, very specifically focused on business professionals in the ancillary side, uh, the, the picks and the buckets of the industry, everyone bringing great resources to bear uh, to this great industry. And so if you haven't been involved with us, welcome to our program. We hope you get involved as members or sponsors. Um, we have a conference coming up for many of you that, that don't know it was in February. We moved it to June 3rd and 4th. Um, and we do these programs every month. So that's all I'm really gonna say about it. I wanna thank our hosts for tonight's program, um, the amazing companies, ACS Laboratory, S2S Insurance Specialists and CanGen. They're all represented here on the panel tonight. So they'll have an opportunity to tell you about their company and services, but we certainly thank them for being our great partners, what they're doing for the industry uh, and what they're about to tell us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to one of our original OG leaders of Cannabis Lab, um, been with us since the start. We appreciate everything he's doing. This topic was his idea. I know for many on this panel, those listening in tonight, we have no idea what's going on in the world of Delta 8, Delta 9, THCO. It, it's getting crazy. So we're excited to have this panel. I'm excited to hand it over to Eric Ron, founder, S2S Insurance Specialist. Thanks, Eric. Good evening and welcome from South Florida. I'm Eric Ron from S2S Insurance Specialist, and as Robert said, a board member of C-Lab. I'm going to be monitored during this amazing panel on this very hot topic. Truth or dare, Delta-8 and novelty cannabinoids. As our in industry continues to emerge, are we reaching a convergence between cannabis and the hemp CBD industry with the introduction of these new CBD products? I'm sure we all have a lot of questions surrounding Delta-8, Delta-9, THC analogs, and other synthetic and semi-synthetic products. I know I do. Is it a hemp product? Is it cannabis TB THC? Is it regulated, unregulated, legal, illegal, tested, untested, insurable, uninsurable? We're gonna talk about all these topics tonight and hopefully get some good answers from our panel. We're going to hear from a very diverse group of experts. Um, and so to begin with, we're going to hear from the lab's point of view, the people who test these products. And you're going to hear from Masha Balanson, charge of corporate growth at ACS Laboratories, my neighbor down the street here in Boca Raton. And she's going to introduce us and give us an overview of of the novelty cannabinoids and THC analogs. Um, I hope she'll touch on what is synthetic versus synthetic products. Uh, potency, big issue. Solvents, pesticides, and most importantly, testing standards and certification. All these things that labs produce as the gatekeepers in the THC world. Are they being adopted here in the C CBD world? So before we begin, Masha, I've heard it called weed light. I've heard it called diet weed. What are we dealing with here? Hi, Eric, thank you. Um, are we gonna talk about who we are first or no? <laughs> Want me to introduce myself or just go right? Absolutely, I left that for you to do. Okay, great. So hi everyone, my name is Masha Bellinson and I, um, I run, content and education for ACS Laboratory. We're calling it corporate growth, but really we are here to educate our clients and the consumers on this new ever-changing industry. So my job is really to look at the, the new laws, look at what's, what's hot and new in the market, make sure that we are covering it in our testing scope, make sure that we're compliant and that we are explaining, you know, we're translating to the business what they need to be doing and presenting it in a very clear way so that our clients understand 
what they need to be testing for and why. Um, my background is I came from, you know, the mainstream world. I've worked at some of the biggest corporations in the world, um, started in uh, IT, hopped over to dot-com, real estate, kind of was always uh, jumped into the market when it seemed to be like at the peak and then was there when it fell. And I really fell in love with cannabis for, you know, many reasons, uh, you know, I'm a patient, I'm a big advocate, and it was an industry that always intrigued me because it was so stigmatized, but yet um, there was so much about the plant that we don't know. So changing people's minds was always something that was interesting for me. And when I moved to Boca, um, I decided that Boca was going to be the cannabis capital of Florida because I was there. And at the time, there was a dispensary ban. So I got to know people really quickly by doing events, educational events, inviting some of the, um, the licensed MMTCs and uh, really finding out, you know, what was it about the plant, the science, the legislation, the patients, helping patients navigate and bringing everything together. That's how I met ACS Laboratory. They were one of my early sponsors. And why I absolutely love working uh, at a lab is that laboratory is that, you know, we're really at the crossroads. So we do test cannabis in Florida for some of the biggest uh, producers in Florida. And we've been doing that since day one. And we started testing hemp, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And it was, you know, we used to say that we test cannabis, hemp, and CBD, you know, because that's, that's all that anybody talked about was CBD. And it's interesting to see, you know, how the narrative has changed and how the laboratory has grown. So we're now a, um, we're a 20,000 square foot facility. We are DEA licensed. We are ISO accredited. We're also CLIA licensed, which means that we can do human trials, which is amazing for research, um, to do pharmacokinetic studies, um, to look at bioavailability and, you know, to look at, at to look at really, it's the research that everybody is asking for, you know, the, the research on cannabis, the research in hemp. And so we test for, we have hemp clients from 49 states and, and 15 countries. It's really amazing. Uh, the growth has been phenomenal and staying up with the, <laughs> staying up with all of the, uh, the compliance and the, and the requirements has been quite fun as well. So, um, you know, that's a little bit about ACS we have. So the main laboratory is in Tampa. It's uh, in Sun City, right, right outside of Tampa. And then I sit in the corporate office in Boca. We've got over 135 people in the laboratory, uh, scientists, chemists, analysts. And then we've got people that do the support, the sales and the marketing team and our president, Roger Brown, we're in the corporate office. So I love, um, you know, been a part of C-Lab since the beginning. Robert used to come to my events in the very beginning. So it's really an honor to be on the panel and talk about, you know, the stuff that I geek out on every day. So thank you for having me. And, um, okay, so where do we start? So, you know, cannabis is a really incredible plant and cannabis has hundreds of cannabinoids um, of which I think we know about 112 of which CBD and THC, those are just two, right? So there's THC, CBD, CBG, CBDA, THCA. I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but there are so many of them. And hemp, although nobody likes to admit it, is basically the same, you know, it's the same plant. It was just, it was, it was um, grown differently to have uh, through, through genetics to have a lower THC potency. So while our cannabis clients all really are, um, they look at, they want the highest THC possible and you know the best terpene profile possible and everyone's obsessed with THC content. With hemp products, it's different. It's, it's the opposite. So we want it to be less than 0.3% potency. And really that's all anyone cares about initially because they can't go to market, right? Because, and that's what we test for potency first and foremost, but as our tagline um, is beyond potency, we test for many other things. So the market has really evolved. 
after the passage of the, the hemp farm bill, which basically made hemp legal in all parts of the plant, so the, which means derivatives. And some of these minor cannabinoids through, they're not new. You know, what we're talking about today, Delta-8, that's not new. It was discovered, you know, probably in the mid 1940s. And then since then, you know, there's been, it's, there's different groups all over the world, you know, that have done their own research on it. So, you know, what's, what's happened and how it's evolved is that there are many people that are locked out of cannabis. You know, they can't, they cannot get into the cannabis industry and they've been maybe, you know, cultivating or they, they're entrepreneurs and they, they, they've been wanting to be in cannabis, but they can't because the barriers to entry are so high. With hemp, um, the hemp farm bill really, it opened it up. And so you've got people that are very, very passionate in their craft that understand cultivation and manufacturing and, and extraction and all of that. And then you've got new people, you know, they're coming into it that just think, oh, you know, this is the, the hottest thing and I'm just going to jump in. And so it's up to us as the third party testing lab to really um, make sure that the products that are, that are coming to market are safe. Of course, they need to be compliant. So for hemp, like I said, below 0.3% THC, but really most importantly, safe for consumption. And we test for, um, so without getting into the numbers and everything, what's required for hemp um, is obviously potency, uh, pesticides, mold and mildew, bacteria and pathogens, heavy metals, and residual solvents. Um, up until now, we always looked at Testing for residual solvents is something you only did for extracts, right? Because there can't be a solvent if there's just the flower. But what we've seen with Delta-8, and you know, we'll get into this a little bit more, is that because it, it, it's naturally derived, but then it's, it's, it's made through a con chemical conversion process, the conversion of CBD, when someone is selling Delta-8 flour, they're spraying it with hemp. Sorry, they're spraying it with Delta-8, right? So we've got to test the flour for residual solvents. And that is, you know, it's, it took education and it took understanding of the process. Um, the origins, again, so the cannabinoids are, um, so CB, CBG, CBGA, CBD, CBDA, there's been a lot of talk about their, you know, effectiveness with COVID symptoms and, and all of that. And that research has been happening for 18, you know, over 18 months, and we have been following it. So, Marsha, can you just kind of give us a, a, a brief rundown? There's Delta-8, Delta-10, and then some of the THC analogs. Can you just give us a brief example of what they are? And, you know, I'm sure Matt can give us a little more, but from your standpoint, what are the different novelty cannabinoids are you testing for right now? So we test for 22 cannabinoids. Um, we just were about to add one more HHC. And we do, so the novels, okay. So Delta 8, Delta 9, and Delta 10, they occur naturally in the plant and they're called isomers. And so Delta 9, which everybody, that's what everybody's obsessed with, THC, tetrahydrocannabidiol, I'm gonna say it wrong. Um, that is the one that, and then very closely to it is Delta-8, and the chemical structure is similar, and um, I'm not a chemist, Matt can chime in, but Delta-8 and Delta-10, they, they are naturally occurring. It's very important to understand that, that they're naturally occurring, but in very small quantities. So when we developed our test, uh, because we test for such a large array of cannabinoids and the way that we've developed our methods is we're able to identify uh, the peaks of exactly Delta 8, Delta 9, and Delta 10. And we're, we're able to separate them through a, a chromatograph. And so you can kind of even look at, look at it and you can see where like the different peaks will go um, and you'll see the levels of potency. 
many products or many laboratories because they're so new and they're not as, you know, they're just not as practiced in their methods. They group these together and that causes a lot of the Delta-8 products to test hot. Okay, thank you. And I'm, we're gonna sure have an interactive question and answer period and we look forward to some of your further input. And then one more thing I just wanna say, yeah. The word analogs. So it's important that we understand what is an analog. It's it's something that looks very closely like something else. Matt, is that would you agree that because we use you know we're using a lot of chemistry words right now that I think we should define. Okay, thank you. So next up in our program is Jonathan Robbins. He's the chair of the cannabis practice at Ackerman. And Jonathan, please introduce yourself. And Jonathan's going to discuss the current issues surrounding Delta 8 from the legal side and discuss current laws here in the state of Florida and who ultimately regulates uh, this industry and this niche within this industry. So Jonathan, give us some insight. Sure. Thank, thanks, Eric. Uh, as Eric mentioned, my name is Jonathan Robbins. I'm going to partner at the Ackerman Law Firm, and I chair our cannabis practice group, which has been around well, since 2014. We launched it uh, right around the time that the Charlotte's Web, the high CBD, low THC law was passed in Florida. And we were the first national law firm to do so. And, and since then, we've had the opportunity to represent a variety of clients, plant touching and non-plant touching in the hemp space, and the cannabis space. And, and I will tell you that things have changed dramatically over the last seven or eight years uh, that we've been doing this because at the beginning of my uh, foray into this industry, the fact is that CBD and hemp uh, and marijuana and cannabis were in the eyes of the federal government really considered the same. Uh, things have changed dramatically, as Matthew said, with the passage or the amendment of the farm bill in 2018. And what the federal government did in 2018 was basically uh, exempt hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. And so if you speak with anybody at the DEA, they will tell you that we do not regulate hemp. We regulate what, what's commonly known as marijuana. Uh, we try not to use that term. We may use the term cannabis, but the reality is that it's all hemp, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, are all the same variety of the of, of the cannabis plant. The distinction being, as Masha mentioned, uh, that it would be defined or characterized as hemp uh, if on a dry weight basis, uh, the plant has less than 0.3% total Delta-9 uh, THC. And by the way, how that is, it is a mad issue, how that's calculated because they do take into consideration uh, Delta, Delta, I'm sorry, THCA as well as uh, Delta 9, but that's a discussion for another panel. But so as we sit here today, the federal government back in 2018 basically said, okay, well, we now will take the position that hemp and hemp derived substances are no longer regulated by the DEA. They are no longer uh, controlled substances. And, and, and part of the rationale behind that was not so that people could go out and get the THC Delta ATHC or Delta 10 or CBD or anything like that. Um, you know, we have a, a dying tobacco industry and we had a lot of farmers with a lot of land in Kentucky and other states. And hemp happens to be a crop that has a variety of industrial uses above and beyond any, uh, any of the other properties of CBD or other cannabinoids uh, that, that we always talk about. Seems simple. Seems rather straightforward. Clients come to us. What can we do? What can't we do? Well, it's never that simple because we happen to have a crop that, whether it be hemp or marijuana, is, is not only regulated heav heavily at federal level, and in marijuana's case, straight out banned, uh, but it is regulated heavily at the state level. And so we have the patchwork of 50 different states with 50 different sets of laws dealing with hemp and dealing with cannabis. Uh, and and uh, today we're going to not talk so much about marijuana, uh, but but substances that are derived from hemp. And that's the interesting issue. Um, people say is THC, Delta ATHC legal? 
and, and some will say, yes, it's legal. You'll see companies saying we could sell it in all 50 states. We could sell CBD in all 50 states. It's perfectly legal. And that's not necessarily the case. First of all, if any of these substances are actually derived from marijuana as opposed to hemp, meaning that it has uh, THC, delta 9 THC levels that exceed 0.3%, then they are illegal. Uh, if, on the other hand, they are derived from hemp, they are legal because the Farm Bill says so. The Farm Bill says that substances and products that are derived uh, from hemp plants are perfectly legal. And so, uh, in addition to the CBD craze that we've seen over the last few years, some people started saying, hmm, well, you know, there are other substances in this plant that could produce a euphoric effect besides Delta 9 THC. Look at Delta 8. Look at Delta 10. Uh, there's an, an THCO is something you'll perhaps have heard about or might hear about, which some people say is stronger than the Delta 9 THC. Um, the, the, the problem and the confusion comes up uh, on, a multi, on a variety of levels. First and foremost, the DEA made things rather confusing last year when they released an interim final rule and that interim final rule made clear that yes, the DEA does not regulate hemp, but uh, Delta 9 THC or other uh, THC related compounds or cannabinoids that have been uh, derived synthetically are illegal. So now we're in this dilemma where there's a question about if you have Delta 8 THC, does it come from hemp or does it come from marijuana? And if it comes from hemp, how was that THC derived? Because it's only naturally occurs in trace amounts in the plant. Uh, and so it, it is not extracted from the plant. As Nasha said, if you, for example, uh, smoke a, a Delta-8 uh, joint or flower, uh, it's, it's really hemp and it's been sprayed with, with Delta-8. So, uh, and, and the reason for that, it does not naturally occur in very high amounts. This is again something Matt can talk about way better than I, uh, but there is a process of converting CBD into Delta-8 THC, and that has raised the confusion. Um, a lot of people saw it as a loophole. A lot of people saw it not as a loophole at all, but uh, certain people said, no, it's synthetically derived and therefore legal. Um, and therefore, it, it, it sent the states into a bit of a frenzy to figure out, you know, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to regulate it? Uh, are we going to regulate it at all? And so a variety of states have come out and straight up just banned uh, Delta ATHC. And so uh, all the things we've talked about and I've counseled clients about over the last several years, well, if it's CBD or, or hemp, you can take it across state lines, but if it's marijuana and it's legal in the state in which you're operating, that's great, but you can't take it across state lines. A lot of those things can arguably go out, go out the window. Um, because you can't take it through states where it's illegal, even if the federal government says it's okay. Holly has been on the cutting edge of this stuff, I have to say. Uh, and the state of Florida came out early, and they are regulating Delta ATHC like they are regulating CBD, in, in my view, properly so. Uh, it has to be tested. There are very strict labeling requirements. There are very strict potency requirements. Uh, there are very strict uh, requirements in terms of the representations that you can make regarding these products. And that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing as lawyers, in addition to, you know, the, the, the corporate and transactional real estate and IP work that we're doing on the regulatory side. Um, we're dealing with a lot of clients that are, you know, asking us, hey, are we going to go to jail? Are we going to, you know, is our board going to go to jail if we get involved in this? We have clients that uh, are media companies that ask us to, you know, come up with the protocols for their advertising, whether they can advertise. And it candidly is not that easy because different states have different requirements. Uh, sometimes you have to, uh, you have to geogate information. Sometimes you have to age gate information, excuse me. Um, so in, in any event, Florida has, has really been, uh, I would say, and, and, and I won't necessarily say this about, uh, you know, when we talk about the regulation of marijuana, but when it comes to the regulation of hemp, we've really been on the ball and, uh, and, and have uh, made it easier for practitioners like us. The types of cases we're seeing where the regulators in the state of Florida are, are coming after 
uh, people in the industry are typically limited to issues such as uh, labeling and representations. And that's what we see on the federal level from the FDA as well. The FDA has sort of stayed out of it uh, by, 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 uh, by uh, um, creating a prescription drug, not creating, but approving a prescription drug called Epidiolex, which is basically CBD. They back themselves into a corner where they can't now say, well, it's not a food additive or a nutraceutical because it's a prescription drug. And so the FDA has more or less stayed, stayed silent on the issue and the action that we're seeing from the regulators like the FDA have been again, uh, more for uh, sellers or purveyors who have been making representations uh, as to curative properties of whatever it is they're selling or in situations where you have products that test hot, meaning that you pull a bottle of uh, CBD tincture off a shelf in a store, you test it, it the THC, Delta 9 THC content is higher than 0.3% or higher or lower than the amount of, for example, is represented on the bottle. And I'm not talking about THC, more CBD. So for example, uh, you have a bottle that says for every uh, you know, eyedropper worth, it's a, a 50 milligrams of CBD, uh, but the either AG's office or the FDA has uh, tested it and it's actually 30 milligrams. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of action that's going to get you in hot water with the regulators. So um, I know we have a big panel here. I don't want to go on for too long, but if there are oh. specific questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for your insight. And that kind of just is a great segue into our next guest, Holly Bell, head of cannabis for the Florida Department of Agriculture. And we're very honored to have Holly with us tonight. Holly's going to give us some brief remarks and explain the state of Florida's position on Delta 8, Delta 10, and THC analogs. The state of Florida has been instrumental in instituting a six-point labeling standard for all CBD products. And Holly's a very hands-on executive, and very knowledgeable regulator who has been working diligently to understand the complexities behind these issues. Holly will be available during our Q&A period to address any of your questions. Um, and by the way, Holly is dressed in 100% hemp clothing today. So Holly, nice to have you, great to see you. Really interested in hearing the state of Florida's position on these novelty cannabinoids. Okay, thanks, Eric, and thank you, everybody. And I'm really honored to be with such a, 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 a impressive group of people to be asked to speak today. So I appreciate that. Um, again, I've, I'm appointed by the Commissioner of Agriculture in the state of Florida, and fortunate to be able to be over the hemp program in the state of Florida, which we got in 2019 got it totally up and functioning in 2020. So we're, we're going into our third year and um, we have well over 10,000 people permitted um, and um, it's, it's a thriving program. It is one of the few fully commercial functioning programs in the United States. We do regulate the industry from growing it all the way to retailing it we do regulate the whole thing. A lot of people will call me up and say, you're not regulating this in the state of Florida. We do regulate everything. So um, we have a very large group at what we call FDAX, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We're very lucky in the United States to have such a strong, good agriculture department that oversees this program. So um, we took many hours to think about this topic and how to regulate the industry. When we wrote the original rules, we workshopped them around the United States. But this particular topic, we spent hundreds of hours researching, talking about, discussing, going down rabbit holes about how to regulate it. And the stance that the state took after all of those hours, and. And the people that thought about this um, aren't just, you know, they are lawyers, they are chemists, they are biologists, they are microbiologists, they are, um, 
all kinds of cannabis experts, hemp experts, bug experts, uh, pesticide, fertilizer. We look at, we have a bunch of people with a lot of history and experience on our team. So the stance that we took was we allow Delta eight because it is naturally occurring in the plant and we allow it to be sold. We also allow Delta 10 to be sold. I do not allow synthetic cannabinoids to be sold. So if it's not naturally occurring in the plant, we're not gonna allow it. And um, if it is naturally occurring in the plant, we will allow it. That is the stance we took. It does have to hit some benchmarks to stay on the shelf in the state of Florida. And believe me, we are out there. We have 150 inspectors. We are out there daily going through shops, pulling products, looking at labels, looking at COAs, making sure you're compliant. So it must pass the total THC test of 0.3. And we use the total formula, the THCA times 0.8777 plus the Delta 9. That must be 0 0.3 or less. That means it's a hemp product. So you also must pass my labeling requirements, my testing requirements, and your COA must be accurate. If you're not gonna pass all of that, I'm gonna pull your product off the shelf and do what we call a stop sell. You have to then correct all the things that are wrong before that product is allowed back on the shelf. So that's kind of the stance that Florida took. And we are continuing that stance and we welcome any questions later on or anything, comments that the people have, you're always welcome to reach out to us. And at the end, I'll give you an email that you can reach out and, and share anything you want with us. So I just have a real quick question for the audience and to you, Holly, is what is the DEA's position on Delta 8 and Delta 10? I mean, I read these articles, <laughs> Certain hemp associations and farmers are suing different states. And you read quotes that the DEA has taken one position. Now they've taken another position. What is, and I know you work closely with all the federal agencies. What is their position? So um, one of the things that, like you said, Eric, is I do talk to the DEA and the USDA and the FDA we work with all of them on a regular basis and not just me, but a lot of my team in their continual stance has been from day one, that it is not a controlled substance. It's out on my website. I host a monthly town hall meeting where we'll talk about all kinds of different topics. And I, I'm not your typical state employee. I, I go, come at this a little differently. I think more information and education is better and it helps everybody feel better about the industry. So I had Sean Mitchell, who's the head of public relations for the DEA at the national level, come on along with Bill Richman, who is with the USDA and he heads up the hemp program for the USDA. I had them on in June and this video is on our website and asked them, and as Sean said, it is not a controlled substance. They do not see it as a controlled substance. And for our audience, I posted the link to that uh, town hall in the chat room, along with the link to the Florida Department of Agriculture and Holly's uh, website, where you, there's a lot of great information there. Thank uh, you, Holly. Uh, yeah, I'll share one other thing and two other things actually with the audience. And this is just a lot of um, common sense. And when I talk to these fellow federal employees, one of the things that, that they say to me is, Holly, we have our hands full with meth, with the opioid crisis, fentanyl. You go down the list. We don't have time to mess with cannabis, to be quite honest. Nobody's dying from cannabis. People are dying from these other things. We've got to get our hands around it. That is a constant message they give me. The other thing I would tell you is when you're coming to a state 
and I didn't understand this. I, I interact with my fellow state directors. I'm very blessed to work in a department with a lot of resources, 4,000 plus employees. Most of my fellow peers in most states, their full departments have maybe 200 total, and they've got to do everything agriculture. So when you're talking about overseeing a hemp program, you got one or two people. They're really short staffed. That's the problem in the states. Thank you so much, Holly, for your input. Uh, very you're welcome. Our next panelist, Matthew Gunther, founder of the American Cannabinoid Association and Delta 8 Science. And Matt's going to talk to us from the private sector point of view as a producer, a pioneer in the CBD industry. And he brings a wealth of knowledge to us tonight. And Matt's going to explain some of the origins and science behind these products, but more importantly, how his company has self-regulated itself, collaborated with the labs, collaborated with the state in helping develop the guidelines behind these products and how they should be made and how they should be tested. And he sets a high standard and he's being proactive. So it's gonna be fascinating to hear firsthand from somebody who has been in the trenches and seen this through and you know has been fighting the battle. Um, and take it away, Matt. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you so much to all the panelists and thank you so much for all the guests for participating. Uh, really excited about speaking tonight. So my name is Matt Gunther. I'm the founder of the American Cannabinoid Association. And uh, I'm also the, the owner of Bloom Holdings, which operates Delta 8 Science. So I've been professionally involved in the cannabis industry for the last seven years, uh, all over the country. And I've had the, the honor and privilege of working with, with great people to build out vertically integrated operations. So everything from genetics, farming, lab processing, wholesale, retail distribution. Uh, I've, I've had my boots on the ground uh, for seven years in this. And it's been really exciting to see the minor cannabinoid side of things begin to develop. Um, you know, what I want to emphasize to everybody is that after 80 to 90 years of prohibition, this is brand new to everybody. That's the reason that I started the American Cannabinoid Association, because in order to, to properly develop this industry, it's going to take retailers, wholesalers, law firms, law enforcement professionals, regulatory industry experts, all working together to create the proper framework. Because, correct, we've got the legislation that is passed at the federal and state levels that has opened everything up. But you know, it takes time for the regulations to catch up to the industry, as Masha and Jonathan and Eric was talking about. I mean, every month there's a new development in the industry, whether it's a new chemical, a new procedure, a new testing methodology. Uh, so, you know, it takes time. You know, the state legislators are, you know, legislative sessions only last for certain portions of the year. It's hard to get these, you know, for the law to get. So because of that, we're big fans of self-regulating, as Eric said. And part of self-regulating is, is adhering to not only the proper, you know, pr processes of testing everything and, and producing everything, um, but, but also, you know, what, what we're working on right now in the association is passing what's called the Cannabinoid Consumer Protection Act. So what it does is uh, it effectively uh, installs age verification requirements because we don't want these products being in the hands of children. Uh, it provides resources uh, for people to register with different states, their local state, so that they know what products and SKUs are being developed and that they are compliant. Uh, you know, it, what I'm kind of getting at is that up until this point, hopefully this changes, but it's largely been up to the industry to regulate itself. And I want to kind of commend the industry. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily guess this, but I think we've done a pretty good job of doing it. I've met so many wonderful, amazing people in the industry that are committed to keeping these products safe. And it's because after 80 or 90 years of prohibition, we finally have the opportunity to research and develop things at the university level. You know, these things aren't schedule one anymore. So now we can start getting grants to do these clinical trials like Masha was talking about. And we don't, we don't want a couple bad apples to ruin the orchard and then start having things banned and moving backwards. And we've done such a good job of moving forward over the last seven to 10 years. 
So that's that's kind of my position. I do want to take the time to thank Holly Bell and the Department of Agriculture in Florida specifically uh, for my larger private label clients. One of the ways that we help self-regulate is whether or not you're selling product in Florida, even if you're selling it in a different state that doesn't have those strict requirements, we make you adhere to those, <laughs> the six-point labeling system, all of the strict texting requirements, because there's there's no reason to accept anything less than the highest standard. And what we're doing is, you know, the key to this industry and moving it forward is education, educating legislators, educating consumers, educating the people, the business owners that may may really be entrepreneurs and, and you know, see the trends and see the opportunity, but may not have the industry knowledge that is required in order to put out the highest quality product. So that's why I really appreciate uh, Eric and C-Lab and everybody on the panel for giving me the opportunity to speak and continue to educate them. Thanks so much, Matt. Really appreciate it. Um, last but not least, David Ron, Senior Marketing Specialist from CanGen Insurance Services. And Dave is going to talk to us about the insurability of Delta 8 and Delta 10 products what risk companies are taking without product liability insurance to cover their Delta 8 products. And more importantly, what are the standards are the carriers looking for to insure Delta 8 and other novel cannabinoids? So these are all really great questions. And I really want to thank C-Lab and Holly Bell and Matt and Masha and Jonathan, especially you, Eric, for coming out so we can have this discussion. Um, First, I'd like to say that certain carriers do look at um, Delta-8 and Delta-10 and also the analog can cannabinoids, and some just look at Delta-8 and everything else is excluded. And some carriers just exclude all the new, all the new novel cannabinoids. <laughs> um, fortunately, CanGen is one of those companies that is looking at Delta-8 risks for product liability on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that's gonna be really important, especially because a lot of these businesses are taking huge risks in not investing in product liability insurance, especially for these products that have these novel cannabinoids. I mean, we're just recently discovering what these cannabinoids can do and if they are essentially you know, safe. You know, we are getting more science and more knowledge by the day, but we need to make sure that these products are made consistently and that they're made safely. We need to know how much potency is in them. We know we need to know how much milligrams of THC is in them. And we need to have certain labeling and certain COAs, especially from what Masha provides with, you know, safe edible hemp and safe um, hemp extract. I believe those labelings are paramount for insurance carriers to even consider Delta-8 risks. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, we've come to that portion of the evening where we're gonna go to some question and answers. And I'm just gonna throw one out to the panel trying to get, get things going, get discussion going. And I think we have a few questions in the chat room, but, um, to the panel. Some would argue that the 2018 Farm Bill enabled the CBD industry by legalizing hemp. And the legislation history makes it clear that the focus was on hemp as an agricultural commodity and not as a backdoor way into legalizing THC. What's your thoughts? I, I'll start by taking this. It's very interesting. And I, I've seen a lot of news and media reports. They use the word loophole to describe the Delta 8, the Delta 10 movement. And what's interesting about that to me is if you look at the language of the farm bill, you know, I, I don't know how you could associate it with a quote unquote loophole. What I mean by that is the language is so chemically specific. I mean, to include the words you know, under, you know, anything, you know, all cannabinoids, legalize all cannabinoids, including 
isomers, salts of isomers, derivatives. I mean, these aren't words that you just pick out of the sky, right? So somebody who ever wrote this was specifically allowing these things to come to pass. Now, did they ever foresee the emergence of Delta 8, Delta 10, and it being prevalent? Probably not. But the fact of the matter is, is that you know, the law is so specific that I think it's it's really hard to say that it was a loophole um, or, or an unintentional consequence, because to me, the, the wording of the legislation shows a legislative intent that's indicative of these, you know, chemical specifics, if that makes sense. So I think that's a fair point. And I would also add, um, Matt, that let's let's not, you know, let's not be unclear here. The fact is that the federal government knew full well that the, yes, hemp is an, an agricultural commodity and, and its uses are phenomenal and immeasurable, but they knew damn well that as soon as the farm bill effectively legalized CBD derived from hemp, that that was gonna be the first major rush. And uh, it, it, it was something that was not aware, I think that uh, in the eyes of the DEA, they perhaps didn't view uh, CBD as psychotropic, and perhaps they weren't concerned about it. And whether they should or not, it's a, you know that's a, a subject for debate. Uh, but they knew it, and candidly, if they wanted to make sure that uh, other cannabinoids like delta eight or delta ten THC were going to be illegal, they could have they could have made that the case, and still can, by the way. Uh, even even. You know, as Holly mentioned, the DEA is, has stated publicly on the uh, on the on the um, on the podcast with Holly uh, and in letter to Alabama very clearly, we don't regulate him. And so, uh, and and by the way, there's another very easy avenue for the federal government to go after these other uh, these other um, analogs, so to speak, is there is a, a a piece of legislation, federal legislation called the Federal Analog. And it basically says that if it's kind of the same thing or almost the same thing as something on the Controlled Substances Act, then it's illegal. And while there's been some academic discussion over it, uh, and certainly some issues raised about it in some uh, in the HIA, the Hemp Industry Association lawsuit, the, the, the DEA has not taken the position publicly, at least, that, oh, we're going to go after people that are selling the Delta 8, and if we can't do it under the CSA, and if we don't regulate hemp, we could still do it under the Federal Analog Act. And they're not doing it. Well, that raises a... Raises it's just to echo uh, something that, you know, both Jonathan and Matt were referencing, especially with government uh, regulation. These insurance carriers are only going to cover the Delta-8 or if they do Delta-10 and other uh, cannabinoids, only where these states allow Delta-8 and Delta-10. I mean, there are about 19 or so states that either have banned, restricted, or heavily regulated Delta-8. So it needs to be something that needs to be considered, especially from an insurance standpoint. We have a question from the audience uh, from BioTools Inc. Uh, is there a way that you uh, can differentiate synthetic Delta-8 or for that matter, Delta-9 or CBD versus natural? Masha or, or Matt, can you address that? I think that it would be tremendously difficult. If you could do it, it would require super high costs. And I think, you know, you, you would be outside the realm of HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography. At that point, you might have to do NMR testing to try to figure out if, you know, what source could make what it, it's, I don't think that it's economically feasible to be able to trace it. Uh, that would be my opinion. Um, I suspect that it has to do with the solvents being used. I think in order to, right? So like, in, it seems like in order to um, make a synthetic, it requires different solvents than to make an, um, an organic. Is I mean, I'm not a chemist. I just play one in the metaverse. So yeah, I mean, once all of the solvents have been, you know, evaporated off or removed, I mean, as long as you know you have qualified lab processors doing that, I, I you kind of get rid of the evidence, right? I mean, at that point, you're, if you're doing a good job and producing high quality delta eight, there shouldn't be much left in there to to tell you where it came from. So, so here's another, I think, consumer question. 
are Delta-8 vape pens being regulated, both here in the state of Florida, and I assume, you know, we had vape gate back in 2018, 19, where we had unregulated CBD vape pens really contaminating the industry. Um, I, can you, here in the state of Florida, how do we go about regulating the gas station vape pens? And, you know, are Delta-8 vape pens regulated? So anybody in the state of Florida that's selling anything inhalable or ingestible with um, hemp in it must have a permit through FDAX. If we kept catch them operating without a permit, we warn them, they have to get a permit or apply within 24 hours. And then we do monitor to make sure they follow through with that. Um, we do go out and inspect and regulate and pull vape pens off the shelf and take them to our lab and test them. Our food safety division has a lab that tests. They have methodologies for cannabis. They're ISO certified, they have a DEA permit, and they have been around doing this now for three years. So um, we do test them. I tested a bunch last week and we stopped sold a couple. So yes, we are regulating it, we are checking it, and um, we are following up on those products that do not comply. And as a follow-up question from the same uh, audience member, do they have uh, code, QR codes on them that match to the certificate? Is that a requirement of your six-point uh, process? Yes, that is a requirement. QR what? code or barcode, it must go back to the COA. We frequently find those don't work. If we find that, we will pull it off the shelf, shelf, excuse me, and stop sell it. To get it back on the shelf, they have 45 days to fix the problem. We, they must prove to us they have fixed the problem before we will release that and let them put it back on the shelf. And that, by the way, could open the door to a wide range of headaches because it's not so simple to just... Uh you know, dispose of these products, first of all, if they fail testing. But beyond that, uh, if you have a bunch of products on the shelves in stores that have either, you know, not met the testing requirements or otherwise satisfied labeling requirements, what have you, you could be faced with a recall. And, and a recall mm -hmm. is a major undertaking. And as, you know, David and Eric, you guys know that that triggers putting your carrier on notice and that really opens a, a Pandora's box. Yeah, for example, we had a, a client that was doing CBD edibles and uh, state made him do a recall. It was published and basically they were uninsurable from their, th that point forward and eventually went out of business. I mean, it, it's a privilege to get a license. It's a privilege to uh, use that license in accordance with the regulations. If not, you lose that license, you lose that privilege. Um, closing comments, let's go around the horn. Let's start with David. Unmute Dave. Um, I see a promising future for Delta A. I see a promising future for all cannabinoids that want to be studied and are being discovered. Um, there's so much more that we still need to learn about this plant. Um, and especially what we can do as far as safety and as far as keeping healthy lifestyles because of it. And I believe Delta A is just a stepping stone in that direction. Okay. Uh, Matt, a few closing words. Yeah, I just, I want to reiterate exactly what David said. I truly believe that we're in the infancy of the, the cannabis and cannabinoid market. And that's why I want to just emphasize, you know, we're in this for the long haul. There, the reason that self-regulation is so important is because in order to achieve longevity in this industry, 
we can't let the few people that see this as a smash and grab opportunity ruin it for the people that want to see this around 100 years from now and want to see the pharmaceutical side, the research and development side start to, you know, become more active. So just for anybody on this panel, you know, I appreciate you attending or everyone on the panel, I appreciate you attending. Any participants that are watching this, if you're involved in the industry, I know I feel like I don't have to say this, but I cannot emphasize this enough please do the right thing on behalf of all of the people that this is helping on behalf of all the hard work that the regulators like like holly have been doing in order to give us this opportunity after 90 years of prohibition just please do the right thing because that's what's going to allow us to to really develop the potential moving forward so thanks man yeah. uh masha you want to give us some parting words i echo what matt says you know low tides sink all ships just do the right thing. There are a lot of really good manufacturers and makers out there. And there are a few, you know, handful of good ones. And, you know, we, we, I have probably 1800 clients across the country. So we see all kinds of things, but I also know that Delta eight helps a lot of people. So let's just not think about it. Like it's bad. Let's ban it. No, let's, let's regulate it because like it's and across the country and get some standards because it really helps a lot of people. And I've seen it. And thank you, Matt, for, for what you're doing. And thank you to the panel. It's been really great. And Holly, I think we'll see each other again on another panel next week at Candelic. We're speaking February 6th also on Delta 8. And then I'll be speaking on mushrooms and comparing extractions, cannabis extracts with um, mushrooms. So thank you, Candelic, February 6th. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Marcia. Holly, thank you so much for joining us. Parting words? Um, we are regulators. We are actually here to help the industry. Email us at cannabis at fdax.gov with any questions. We answer that within 24, 48 hours. Um, our job is to support the industry and be here, but to make sure it is safe and compliant. So um, we are regulating the industry. My webpage has a load of information on it that you can go out and find. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. I will tell you that um, Delta A came about for a reason. And when everybody wants to complain to me about this and pontificate about a lot of things, I, I stop them and say, listen, people are buying it. They're buying it for a reason. Consumers don't buy things they don't like. So ask yourself why consumers are buying this. And um, I know because I've, I've been a part of some market studies and sure enough, some people are starting to gradually listen to that. And I think this industry needs to talk to their customers and clients more and ask them what they want and what they like. That's a key that they don't do enough of. Those are my parting words. Thank you, Jonathan. Words of wisdom? Well, along Matt's do the right thing lines, I, I couldn't agree more. If we want the research to be done, if we want this industry to, to thrive, uh, then we do have to do the right thing. And that means hire the right professionals. Make sure that you have good legal advice. Don't have to be me. Good legal advice, good accountants, the right testing lab, the right insurance professionals, because otherwise, uh, this industry is not going to head in the right direction. And candidly, uh, regulation is not a bad thing at all because these are consumable products and we're dealing with consumer safety issues here. And the fact is, and I'll tell you this is the you know, father of teenagers, people are going to do what they're going to do. And I'd much rather have a market that is highly regulated with testing requirements than have an, a thriving illicit market. So yeah, don't, uh, uh, this is not a case where it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Let's get permission on this one. Dot the I's, cross the T's. Well, thank thanks everybody. I just want to give a few parting words myself. First, thank you to our amazing panel. I think uh, we really had a good conversation here tonight. I hope our audience learned a little. I know I did. Um, I myself, I'm an insurance broker. I deal primarily in the cannabis and psychedelic uh, industry. If I can be of help, if you are a CBD or a uh, 
uh, THC provider or ancillary services. I'd love to uh, talk to you about your business and how you fit within the supply cycle. But I think as this industry matures, as we move down this path, and really, you know, we're a $20 billion industry, we're only, you know, five years old, and we keep evolving and we keep on moving down. I've come from past regulated industry. It took 20 years before regulations and regulators and the industry was in tune with each other. And that all comes down to state funding and how serious they are about their regulations. And I think to here in the state of Florida, I think it sounds like we're ahead of the curve and that's a good thing. Um, so be safe, know what you're, you're consuming, and, you know, enjoy what this plant has to offer. So with that, everybody from Sea Lab here in South Florida, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know this is a recorded uh, uh, discussion, so it should be up on our Sea Lab link in a, in a few days. And uh, if you want to copy the link and send it on to somebody who might enjoy it, feel free to do so. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Night.